Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I must say this is quite a surreal experience. It's the first one of these sort of webinars I've done. I've got no idea how many people I'm speaking to. I guess this is what it's like uh, presenting on radio or something. Um, but it's, uh, I think we're, it'll work. I've uh, done my best to try and get some live spiders for us to see. Let's look at the outline of the session. So I'm just gonna run through a PowerPoint or part of the PowerPoint, which is an introduction to what we look for really when we're trying to identify spiders in the field. Uh, so, you know, like how to tell it's a male or female, how to tell it's a spider up front. And then we look at a, a very, very, very briefly look at the life cycle of the spider, look at some photos of spiders, just to talk about in general what kind of features we're looking for when we try to identify them. Again, briefly look at some uh, equipment that you might um, use, what you, what you need uh, to, to look at spiders. And then we'll look, I'll break the PowerPoint and we'll look at some live spiders under a digital microscope. Then we'll go back to the PowerPoint We'll look at some of the resources you can use to help you ID spiders. In particular, we'll look at the wild guide um, and mention some other resources. Briefly talk about recording spiders. We'll have a quiz, if there's time, a little a true or false quiz, which you can score yourself on. It's not formal. Uh, and then we'll have a, a question and answer session. Okay, so these are the five main orders of, arach of arachnids. So arachnids is a, is a class of uh, animals and within there we have some major divisions which, which are called um, orders. And so we've got spiders, pseudoscorpions, which not a lot of people um, have seen, even if they've heard of them, ticks and mites, which I'm sure you've all seen and heard of. Uh, my, my friend Nigel Kane Honeyset likes to say they find you, you don't find them. Scorpions, believe it or not, we do have a, a few um, colonies of, of the uh, European uh, scorpion down south and harvestmen, which are often confused as spiders, and we'll look at how to separate those in a minute. So those are the five, the five main groups of arachnids which we find in the UK. Worldwide, there are many more groups, something like a dozen or, or even more, I think. Here's a, a couple of arachnids which aren't spiders. So we've got um, a harvestman up there, um, Megabonus diadema in this case, uh, a beautiful little thing, and it is very little, even though it's got relatively long legs with this fantastic crown of thorns, very different from a spider, because it's only got two eyes. Most spiders have six or eight. Um, and they are, they are raised on this little sort of turret on the top, top of the body here. And this is a pseudoscorpion, so a bit like a scorpion, but without the stinging tail. These are tiny, um, few millimetres long, but they're more abundant than people realise. And if you went out sieving leaf litter, for example, in woodland, if it was, uh, as long as it's fairly damp, you're, you're bound to find these. In fact, I find them most abundantly in the winter. If I shake a bit of moss out uh, to sieve it in the winter, I always turn these things up. Let's look at the body plan of a spider and uh, a harvestman, in this case, in comparison to an insect. So. For most of you will know, an insect has three main body parts. So it has the head, the thorax in the middle here. I'm moving my mouse about. Can you see my mouse? Put your thumb up if you can see my mouse. No? Oh, yes, you can. So the thorax in the middle of the insect there, and then the abdomen at the tail end. So three main body divisions. In contrast, the spider really only has two. The front two, the head, and the thorax are kind of merged into this area which is termed the cephalothorax. Sometimes also called the carapace, so the actual bit of body armour that covers this cephalothorax from the top is called the carapace, so sometimes you hear the whole area re uh, referred to as that. And then this tail end, the abdomen, so two main sections. And if you look at a harvestman, and this is the key to tell if something is a harvestman or a spider, both of them have eight legs and they confuse a lot of people, is that a harvestman, all its body parts are merged more or less into one big body part. There's no distinct waist between the abdomen and the cephalothorax region. Whereas in a spider, there's a definite waist. Although the abdomen sometimes overlaps the cephalothorax quite a bit and the, the waist can be hidden, but you can see the two body parts. This is how to tell the difference between a male and a female spider, as long as they're both um, mature. 
the, the male has these secondary sexual organs on the end of its palp. So both females and males have palps and it's like this extra set of little legs at the front of the body here. But only the males have swellings on the end. The females are more or less the same thickness all the way up with one or two very um, rare exceptions in, in the mummy spiders. And these swellings on the end in a mature male spider are the secondary sexual organs. So that's what they use to transfer the sperm. The sperm isn't generated there, it's generated in the body, but they tr transfer the sperm from those palps into the female's uh, structure called an epigyne. And so that's the main way of telling a male from a female, looking for, for these swollen uh, palp ends. Now they're very, very variable in structure um, between different species. Uh, within a species, they're fairly constant in structure because they're sexual organs and they have to, they have to engage with the female organs. We'll see a picture about that in a minute. So these are the main things to look for when trying to tell a male from a female. So here's a species common around houses. It'll probably be on all of your houses. It's called um, uh, Steatoda bipunctata. It's one of the false widows. It's a native false widow. Um, been here forever. Uh, it's a rather attractive spider, like a lot of the false widows. It's very glossy um, body. And, it, and the male, relative to its body size, has these absolutely huge palps. And there's a corresponding, this is the epigyne on the underside of the abdomen of the female. And that palp kind of fits into that epigyne. It's often likened to a lock and key. So this is what stops a lot of hybrid, you know, hybridization between species. In other words, it promotes speciation. It's this differentiation in the um, sexual organs between the species. So even where you have very, very similar species that look identical to the eye, you can often separate them, usually separate them, if you put them under a microscope by looking at the sexual organs. Now, we're not talking about that today. That's microscope work, and it relies on preserved specimens. We're going to talk about what you can do in the field without going that far. This is the life cycle of a spider. So the female lays eggs in a whole variety. Absolutely, this is a subject in itself, um, you know, the structures of the different um, egg sacs and little webs that they use to protect uh, their eggs. Fascinating diversity there. Uh, the spiders hatch into little spiderlings. This is a typical picture of the garden spider, a little ball of spiderlings, which you've probably all, all seen. And then they go through a series of molts. So unlike some of the insects that have a big bang approach to molting, I forget what that's called, is it hollow metabolism or something like that? In contrast to that, um, arachnids have a series of molts. So when they hatch out of the eggs, they're just like mini adults really. And then they, with each successive molt, and there can be five, six, seven, depending on the size of the spider, then they um, reach adulthood. One or two of the larger spiders actually carry on molting periodically after they're adult. Those are ones that live for several years. But most don't. Once they're adult, that's, probably, that's their last molt. In the world, there are more than 40,000 species of spiders. We have around about 670 in the UK. These slides are quite old and the numbers go up all the time. So forgive me if they're a little out of date, including the families, which is probably revised now. But we have roughly 37 different families. So different groups, different types of spiders uh, in the UK. 280 of our 670 odd species belong in one family called the Linifiidae. To you and me, that's the money spiders. So those, those little ones that you that blow along in the wind sometimes and you find on, on, on your body, supposed to be good luck, they're in this money spider group. But it is a diverse group. We'll be looking at one later, which is quite a big spider. In contrast to that, biodiversity we have in, within the spider group, the harvestmen and the pseudoscorpions aren't as diverse in the UK. So there's only about 30 harvestmen, about 30 pseudoscorpions. Actually, it makes them quite a look, nice little groups to study um, because you can get your head around them quite quickly, whereas spiders take a bit more work to get to grips with. And most, but most people that study spiders in the field We'll also study harvestmen because you find harvestmen when you're looking for spiders and vice versa. Okay, here are some spiders. So this is a money spider, Linifia triangularis. Both of these are actually. The one, in, the one on the right, Erigoniatra, 
Um, I'm, most of the spiders don't have common names, so I'm going to use the Latin names now and again. Don't be put off by them. I mean, it's just a money spider to most people. But this little one down here is your typical little black money spider that people find on them. You know, they balloon, what's called ballooning, when they blow in the wind uh, and disperse that way. This is a, this isn't a Rigoniatra, but this is another small money spider up here, which is ballooning. So it's paying out this silk into the air. And it used to be thought that the wind then catches that and the spider lets go of the thing it's holding. It looks like a dandelion head in this case and flies off into the air. Recent research is showing that it might be electrostatic charges acting on that silk, which are just as important, if not more important than the air, the air currents. On the left hand side here, we have one of the larger money spiders, very, very common all over the place, probably common in your gardens. If you, if you look in hedges and so on, you might see these sheet webs, um, almost flat, but sometimes pulled up like this one is like a little tent. And if you see a spider on the underside of that, hey, upside down like this, quite, quite large, maybe six, seven millimeters long body length, then that could be this one, Linithia triangularis. That might have a common name, but I forget what it is. I do apologize, I don't know a lot of the common names. When we look at the live spiders, I've got the common names written down. Just before we move on to some of the bigger spiders, I wanted to show you many spiders. Now, naturally enough, when you're looking at spiders in the field, you tend not to concentrate on the money spiders because they are so small. And if you're a mother, if you've ever done moth work, it's a lot like the division between, or the old division between, micro moths and macro moths. You know, a lot of people looked at macro moths but didn't bother with the micros because they were small and difficult. And it's a bit the same with spiders. So we tend to look at the larger spiders in the field. But I've already said, you know, some of the money spiders are quite large. And the other thing about money spiders is these amazing structures on a lot of the males. So this is, all we're seeing here is the, the Kevlar thorax, the, the head and the body, the top part of it, um, without the abdomen, without the legs. And look at these turrets, you know, with the eyes on, really, really wacky shapes. And if you see one of these in the field and you can see it with a, with a magnifying glass, you can identify it. I mean, there's quite a lot of money spiders that you can identify. So I would encourage you to look at money spiders, even if you don't try and identify them all. We're going to see this, this one on the next slide in a bit more with a colour picture and you can see how amazing it is. This isn't an uncommon spider. And I, I found it a few times, but usually I've found them not, not quite adult. So this turret not quite so big, but even then you can tell because there's nothing else with the turret quite like that one. But I found the first one of these adult males, that is, I found the first one last winter. And I suspect that maybe this is one of the species that is, has a lot of mature adults in the winter. And that's why we don't see them so often because a lot of people don't look in the winter. But I found that by sieving leaf litter uh, in a woodland up on, up on the moors here. Not an uncommon spider, absolutely amazing thing to look at. This is one that you'll all have seen. So this is uh, the garden spider, Araneus uh, diadematus. So extremely variable spider. We will look at a live one in a minute, which looks a bit like this one on the left here. So it builds this typical orb web um, with a field in. This is called the hub in the middle. And with these sort of classic orb weaver family, uh, uh, the Araneidae, their hub is filled in. There are other orb weavers that leave a hole in the middle, and that can be a clue to identification. But look how variable it is. The one down in the bottom right is the same species. So it's not only variable in colour, it's variable in pattern as well. well it's called the garden cross spider, obviously, because of this. So it's, it doesn't say garden cross spider there, does it? But that's another common name for it, the garden cross spider or the cross spider, so-called because of this cross uh, shape here in the patterning. But often these two side bits can be very reduced or missing altogether. So it's very, very variable. And I, again, I come back to moths. If you're practiced with moth identification, that's good training for identifying live spiders in the field because it uses a lot of the same skills. You have to kind of judge how important is the color. Well, the color is often quite important, but not as important as the pattern, but the pattern too can be variable. And it's weighing up all those things, you know, gaining experience of, how variable can that species be that makes you good at identifying them in the, in the field? You shouldn't expect, even with a good book, to be able to identify things straight away. Just like moths, if you've ever done moths, you get your book, but it takes a long time to really get good at it. But the, book, the book's a great help, but you need that experience, chiefly of understanding the variation of 
patterns and coloration that you will encounter. Okay, here's a orb web of the garden cross spider with the little spiderlings. Here's the classic web with the hub filled in in the middle. This is a different family now. So this is the noble false widow, Theotoda nobilis, a very glossy spider, not, an un, not a dissimilar body shape to the orb weavers that we've just been looking at. Um, but uh, the main clue, I think, for telling these apart when you see them in the field, if you're not, if you're not experienced with it, is the web. So it hasn't got an orb web at all. It has this kind of tangled mass of a web. Sometimes it looks like a damaged web, but this is how these spiders build, build their webs. This is a, in a family called the cone-footed spiders, the Theridiidae, which is very, very variable. There are some tiny, tiny ones and some big ones like this. Um, we don't really get these up in Ch Cheshire Lancashire here, but they're all over southern Britain. I know that a lot of you, a lot of you aren't in Cheshire Lancashire probably looking at this video. Uh, and they're spreading all the time. Absolutely beautiful spider, very docile in my experience. I've never been bitten by one, I've held them. Um, nothing to be frightened of. They're all over my 83 year old mother's house down in Essex, and she doesn't worry about them. This is a wolf spider, so totally different body shape here. So, okay, it's a lovely picture of that, but you don't really see them like that unless you get very, very close. Then more, they look more like the two pictures over on the right, especially the top one there. They run very fast over the ground. They don't build webs. They use silk, all spiders use silk. So they'll drag a, a drag line, for example, to help them if they get into trouble, might also help them return, I don't know. Um, might add pheromones in it to attract um, uh, the opposite sex. So all spiders use silk, but not all of them build webs for catching prey. These hunt down their prey and they've got correspondingly large eyes um, to do that. When you see them in the field, they'll look a lot darker than this. You do have to see them in a very strong light to see the coloration on, on most of them. Most of them look almost black in the field, okay? So bear that in mind when you look at some of these pictures too. Absolutely charming things. The males, it's a male down there in the bottom right, as you know from the boxing gloves there, actually uses those pouts, those boxing gloves, as kind of little semaphore signals to signal to the female to see if she's ready to mate. Another charming thing about these uh, spiders, this family, the wolf spiders, is they, well, number one, they carry their egg sac around and people often, inexperienced people will often look at that and say, oh, well, I saw a spider with a big blue bum, <laughs> but sometimes that's a wolf spider with a kind of bluish silk um, egg sac, which it's got um, strapped to its spinnerets and it's carrying it around a bit. Charmingly, they also, the, the, the youngsters, when they hatch out, hitch a ride on, the, on their mother's back for a little while before dropping off. Quite a diverse group. 20 or 30 different types of wall spiders. One of the most beautiful spiders in England, I think, um, is the um, Arctosa perita, it's called. I don't know if it's got a common name, but think of it as the sand dune wall spider. Uh, beautifully camouflaged there. That one's on the Sefton coast. This is, a, a, again, another really beautiful spider, very, very common in the summer, uh, called the nursery web spider, so called because it builds a kind of nursery web, which we'll look at on the next slide. Um, very, very variable in coloration, as you can see from the two uh, specimens there in the top, it's almost orange there, grey there, but certain features are, are consistent. Very often a, a thin median line down the carapace here, you can see it better on this one. And these little mustachial stripes, if you look at the bottom right picture, you can see those little triangle um, white patches on, on the face and though and you can see them on this one here too and that is a constant feature so it's getting used to looking for those things otherwise it can look quite a lot like a wolf spider can't it but another characteristic thing is this stance here nursery web spiders often stand with the front two pairs of legs close together like that one there this is the nursery web here so the female places the egg sac within this web which she spins over the top of vegetation called the nursery web and that's where it gets its name and she stands guard. So she carries the egg sac around for a long time and then when she thinks they're ready to hatch she builds this nursery web, deposits the egg sac in it and the young hatch out and she guards them for a little while too. Fascinating spider not just because it's beautiful and it's big but also because of the, the courtship display which has been studied for, for many many years and this plate on the left there um, from a famous book on spiders by Bristow is showing um, the courtship of the male and female. The male actually, this isn't an egg sac, this is a, uh, well it's supposed to be a 
a parcel of food which he wraps up for the female and presents to her and while she's distracted with that he mates with her there's been a lot of research on on these um, animals recently which has shown that sometimes he wraps up a bit of dirt or sometimes nothing at all so there's actually a lot of research into the sort of economics and e e ecological economics of lying that has been conducted on these spiders it's fascinating beautiful animal okay some quick word about silk then hanging out with spiders if when you're looking at spiders in the field really look for silk that's my top tip you know don't look for webs now depending on how good your eyes are and also the conditions outside sometimes they're harder to see than others one little tip, uh, trick is to take a little like a water sprayer a mister and if you think you can see some silk you can spray the the, the mister over the web and then you can see it a lot better um, but here's an example of the two of two different orb webs on the right well number one if you see an orb web like this there's only two or three different families it can be and immediately from 670 odd species in the british fauna you're down to about 60 because it's got an orb web okay so so nuts so seeing the spider with its web is a massive clue to its identity and then you look in more detail at the web this one hasn't got a hub it's got a hole where the hub is and that puts it into a family called the tetramethidae uh, and this one has got a hub in it so this is like the typical um, garden spider web uh, the araneidae so again that splits it off into a, a sort of a couple of dozen species in each case there if it hasn't got a classic web uh, you, well we've already talked about Pisora, the um, nursery web spider and the sort of tangle webs or, or the sheep webs sorry of Linithia, the money spiders. Typical web you might see on the outside wall of your house, this sort of this sort of very scrappy looking web, lacy web, and that's the lace weavers that, that make that. And you can tell that, that spider or that genus of spiders immediately from that web, and that means it can only be one of three spiders. So looking for the silk and getting to know silk, know silk and how it's used is a massive part of field craft for identifying spiders. Quick talk about techniques there. Um, there's some people here in typical arachnologist sampling gear. <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't wear that in the field or, or that down there, but they are using some of the equipment which I do use. So sweep net is very uh, useful. It's a relatively cheap way of collecting a lot of spiders quite quickly by sweeping it through high vegetation. Some people are using vacuum samplers now. I use one myself occasionally, and these are petrol driven ones, but you can now get quite good electrical ones that are sufficient for um, sampling spiders. Obviously, you have to stick a net over the end, so you have to modify them a little bit. Beating vegetation into a sheet or a net like this in bottom right. Some people use pitfall traps top right. The bit of equipment shown down there is a pooter. So that young chap is using a pooter to suck up some spiders. I I use this, um, so that's a pooter, and it's just two different thickness lengths of tube stuck together with a bit of actually a bit of stocking to stop the spider going down my mouth when I suck it up. And for me, that's the easiest way of picking up a small spider in the field without damaging it. Some people like to use a brush or something like that. But that's all. That's a lot of equipment, isn't it? You don't need all that. The point I wish to make to you quite strongly is that all you really need to start studying spiders in the field is your eyes, really, absolutely all you need. A couple of other little bits of equipment I think are useful too. Obviously a lens, so either there are lenses come in all shapes and sizes, so there's a couple that I use right there. This one I got for about five quid on the internet, it's got a little light on it as well. Um, but you have to use those lenses you have to get quite close to the spider sort of a bit like this so that's quite difficult with a live spider so what you can use is a is a, a spy pot or a clear plastic envelope or a tube which you you can pop it in and then push a bit of tissue or something in to restrict its movement but you can actually sort of custom make a piece of equipment like this called a spy pot and on the link that uh, Leanna will give you uh, also, the sheet of information which I've done that Leanna will give you a link to, uh, I think she's posting it in chat, there's a, a video on how to make one of these, okay, so what it what it does, it's a tube, oops, this has got a spider in it, which I don't, I'm showing you in a minute, I don't want to lose that, so it's basically a 
tube, any parallel sided tube with a bit of cling film over the edge and then a plunger. And you can push the plunger until the spider is quite restricted in its movement. And even if you press it against the, um, against the uh, clean film, it's, as long as you do it lightly, it's not gonna damage it. And then you can use your lens and you can get right up close to it without, that, without hurting the spider. You can even put it on its back and make sure you can see the underside if you wanna see the epigrine and so on. So that's a really useful bit of kit. I wouldn't be without one. And that's all you really need, your eyes, and preferably a lens and some sort of pot like a spy pot to put uh, your stuff in, your spiders in. Okay, we're going to take a break and look at some of these spiders now. So if you bear with me, I'll just switch out of my um, uh, slideshow here and start up the software. Okay, you should hopefully be able to see that. Good. So this one, this is the one that I was just, I just had up. I'm uh, just going to restrict its movement a bit by pressing it slightly lightly against the... So this is one of the larger mummy spiders. So I've got a ballpoint pen here, just an ordinary ballpoint pen to give you an idea of scale. So it's, it's not tiny, okay, but it's not massive either. The end of that ballpoint pen is about a centimetre long, so the brown bit is about a centimetre long. So this is... Uh, a little spider called a Neriani clathrata. It's actually probably, I'm not sure if it's better in the sunlight or out the sunlight there. What I hoped you'd be able to see on this, but I can't see it too well, is the two body parts. So let me just let it wander about a bit more. I might have to move it, which I know isn't great for you looking at it. But you can see, I think, just about probably there that it's got the head. Yeah, there we go. The head just behind the, the legs there at the front and then the abdomen at the back. So two body parts, which definitely says that this is a spider. So that's Neriani clathrata. Uh, sorry, not Neriani. Neriani peltata, that is. Um, this is not a spider. <laughs> just want to show you this quickly so you can really get a feel for the difference. So here's a, a harvestman, yeah? And you can just see it's just got one single body part. Let me try and focus that a bit better. Looks a lot like spider. People think they are spiders, but when you look closely, you can't see those two body parts, just a single body part. And that's what tells me that that is a harvestman. Right, that's, just, that, that's in a very big spy pot, and I'm just pulling the plunger back so it's got room to move about, so it's fine now. So this is Araneus diadematus, the, the garden spider, in other words. And then this one, in contrast to the pictures we saw, let me just see if I can focus that a bit better for you. You can see the patterning, or that the garden, the cross, where it gets its name from really well. Now, so most of the, the spiders I'm going to show you right now are from the Araneidae, the um, orb weavers, simply because at this time of year, those are the ones you tend to find because they're maturing now and getting large. Um, but it also serves to show, I think, how you can tell the difference between quite closely related species. One of the things which tells me that this is a classic orb weaver spider, apart from the fact obviously I can recognise it from the cross, is this pattern on the back, which is like a, can you see this sort of leaf type pattern here? This sort of dentated pattern here, like an oak leaf. Well, that's called the folium. Folia being Latin, I think, for leaf. And a lot of the orb weavers had this basic design with this folium on the abdomen, even though the, the pattern within and around that can be different. And that's a clue to the fact that this is a um, one of the orb weaver spiders. Now we're going to look at a sister species of this now. So that that was. The garden spider, Araneus diadematus, and this is the four spot orb weaver, Araneus quadratus, which is an absolutely beautiful thing. This, that was a female, this is a big female as well. So you can see, it's still, you can see a lot of similarities, oops, a lot of similarities. We can still see the folium edged in white on this spider, 
We can see the same sort of body shape, the big globular abdomen overhanging the cephalothorax. There's a lot of cephalothorax behind this abdomen. And then the thing which gives this one away as to its species is, of course, those four spots, the four spotted old weaver. This is the reputed to be when it gets um, very gravid, pregnant, in other words, ready to lay eggs. This is reputed to be the heaviest spider in England, even heavier than um, the big raft spiders and so on, when it's really, really gravid. An absolutely beautiful spider. Again, very, very variable in colour, um, but quite consistent in the patterning. Another thing I should say is that the males of some spiders, and in, in this family uh, in particular, can be quite different from the females, and in particular their body is much smaller. But most of the ones I'm showing you today are females. So this is something called um, Larinoides cornutus. I forget what its common name is. Have I got it written down? No, oh, I haven't got a common name written down for this one. So it's in the same family. It builds a, a, an orb web just the same. And again, we can see the folium on the abdomen. But then it's got this sort of characteristic blotchy pattern, almost split into four areas, but not four distinct areas like the um, four spotted orb weaver had. And it's, uh, yeah, once you get your eye into this, quite distinctive. Again, very, very variable in coloration. You can get some of these which are literally bright orange, but the patterning tends to be similar. Okay, so, so patterning more important than coloration, but it doesn't mean coloration isn't sometimes an important clue. I'm going to show you again another species in the same genus as this, but slightly different. So this is another Larinioides. This is much less common. This is probably the most uncommon spider I'm showing you today. And this is called Larinioides scopitarius, also called the bridge spider. So again, you can very, very clearly see the folium on this, the sort of leaf-shaped pattern on the abdomen. But in contrast to its the other species you just saw in the same genus, the edging of the folium is very, very sharply defined in these almost these like um, hair like white outline. Otherwise, the pattern on that is quite similar to the um, one we saw previously. But those really, really um, sharply defined outline on that folium is what um, is a big clue to the identity of this species. The other is where it's found. Its common name is the bridge spider, because it's almost invariably found on man-made structures next to water. And this is very, very under-recorded in the whole of the UK. So I'd urge you to go out to, to railings, especially, or bridges over, over rivers, and you could well find this. But the trick is you have to go at night, because this is a very um, uh, light phobic species. And because they go on bridges and on railings and that kind of thing in the day they often find a way inside those structures so you've not hope of seeing them but if you go at night they're right there in the middle of their huge webs you might see their huge webs in the daytime but at night go there and you'll find um, the spider sitting in the web beautiful thing that another species in the same family more common, this one, this is Nuctenia umbratica, otherwise known as the walnut spider or the toad spider. It's a very, very, quite a big thing, like the others. You can see that, so well over a centimetre long in its body. Again, it's got the folium. That sunlight is blowing it out a bit, isn't it? It's got the folium, but it's a much darker spider all round, and it's got these very obvious sort of indentations that on, on, on its abdomen in the, in the middle of that folium. A very squat spider, but also ventrally flattened. So if you look at this spider from the side, it looks squashed from top to bottom. And that's so it can fit into uh, crevices in wooden fences and that kind of thing. Uh, lovely spider, again, very, very nocturnal. If you want to find this, the best, best way to do it is to go out with a torch at night. Okay, so those, those were all um, of the same family, the uh, orb weavers. We're going to look at one now in a different family. So this is in the Tetramethidae, but these still build an orb, an orb web. But these are the ones that build an orb web with the hub missing. Okay, so there's a hole in the centre of the web. 
Uh, there, there are two species um, that look like this really and that sit on those type of webs. One is more common in spring, one is more common in autumn as uh, now. So this is the thing called Metalina segmentata almost certainly that's, uh, that is the autumn um, one. And it has this very, very characteristic pattern. It looks a bit like a garden spider. So I've seen these referred to as lesser garden spiders. So these two families are very closely related, but they are different families. It's got this very sort of characteristic pattern where you get this very sort of wide pale area at the front there and then another area behind it and the sort of white patches down the side. Still got that kind of folium, annulated legs. That's the sort of, uh, you know, the darker rings on the pale legs. And also quite a characteristic pattern on the carapace there, this sort of funnel shaped pattern. And that's a really quite common spider uh, that's around now. Obviously all of these spiders are around now because I've just collected them to show you. This is a one of the cone footed spiders. So you remember I showed you the slide of um, uh, Steatoda nobilis before. So and said it was a cone-footed spider. So this is also a cone-footed spider. I don't know if we can see that very well. Put it in the light. No, that's worse. And this has a very characteristic body pattern. And there are two species which look almost identical. So as soon as you, once you get your eye in for this and you see these in the field, also the kind of web retreat they're in, it's a tangled web like Steatoda's was, the noble false widow. And it has a little retreat where it sometimes takes um, prey and leaves the prey there. It's one of the few spiders which nurses its young. So after the eggs are hatched and you've got the spiderlings, this spider will actually provision the, the spiderlings with food for a little while. Beautifully patterned thing. Um, you can see how big it is there. So it's, let's put that same level. So probably about three millimeters long, something like that. Quite a distinct pattern on the um, Kepler thorax as well. As I say, there are two species which look like that, which really have to be separated under the microscope to be 100% sure that there are some clues that can, that can point to one or the other, if you look, especially if you look at the underside of them. So that was uh, that was Phylonita is the genus of that. I don't know. I don't think it's got a common name. Here's one that you will find all around your house, outside mostly, but also inside occasionally. And this is one of the lace weavers. So let's try and focus that bit. Okay, hang on. I don't know why that's not focusing very well. Let me try and move the spider. Bring it a bit nearer the top. No, I apologize, I can't, I can't seem to focus that. But this is, you can see enough of it to see the key ID features, I think, which is on the abdomen, it has a very, very sort of, it's a dark spider, but on the abdomen, there is a, a pale patch with this almost rectilinear dark patch bang in the middle of it on the abdomen. And these are the ones that build the lace, the lace webs. So they're called lace weavers around, around your house in the walls in that, on the walls in, around the house. So there's only about, there's, there's three species in the genus. You can really tell them apart more on their habitat preferences than anything. So this one that I found on the house will be Amarobia similis, whereas the ones, some of the ones you find away in woodlands and so on, uh, will be something called Amarobius fenestralis. So very, very similar species, but their habitats kind of give them away. Bring that in there. Okay. Okay, I think that's uh, all the spiders I'm going to show you. Let's go back to the um, presentation now. Bear with me a second. So let's talk about resources. So <clears throat> here are some of the books you can get. The one over on the right is the one, you know, the sort of Bible for microscope users. So you don't, you don't want that if you want to ID spiders in the field particularly. And the one on the left, the Collins Guide to Spiders, is, and the one below it is just the same book with a different cover, the older version of the cover. 
again, they're really, they're really sort of abridged versions of the one on the right. They're more for microscope use than anything. And until very recently, we didn't really have a, a really good book for field use. There was an old thing called the, the oh, it was by a guy called Dick Jones, and I think it's called the Country Life Guide or something like that, which was good, but it wasn't very comprehensive. But a few years back, we got this new wild guide called Britain's Spiders, and it's absolutely revolutionized, I think, the way um, we think about field idea spiders. Compared to a lot of invertebrate groups, the community around recording spiders in Britain has been extremely conservative about what you can do without a microscope. But those attitudes are changing, partly because more is possible now with the advent of digital photography and that kind of thing, but also because books, publications like this have been produced, which really show that we can do much more than we ever thought we could in terms of certainty of identification on live spiders in the field. This is the, this is the book you can see there. Uh, this is the new edition, which has literally just come out in a, a few days ago. Um, the new edition obviously contains a lot of corrections. This was the first edition, this, so there were mistakes in it and so on. Minor mistakes, nothing drastic. So if you're buying it new, you could probably buy this, but if you wanted to pick up a bargain and you didn't have a lot of money, you could probably buy that one quite cheaply now, uh, if you can get hold of it. And it's an excellent book. They're both excellent books. I want to talk about that, that in a bit more detail in the next couple of slides. Before I move on, there's the FSC um, pull out chart, which is three quid, I think, to spiders, which is useful, but it has its drawbacks. And one of the, one of the, them is that you can't really tell the scale of stuff from it. Also, it may, it's, it suffers a bit from, you know, the old chinnery effect that it puts a name to some spiders on that chart, but it doesn't tell you that there's another one that looks extremely similar that isn't on the chart. So there's some caution needed in using that FSC fold-out chart. But let's look in a bit more detail at the wild guide. I love it because it's, uh, it's got so much in it and so much information on every page. It runs you through the different families. You've heard me talking about the different families today, the all web spiders, for example, the Araneidae. It tells you the key features of what to look for. Uh, there's the crab spiders, the Tomicidae there. It's got whole sections on different webs, you know, and really goes into it, not just a cursory look at it really, but really tries to tell you what are the key features that you can look for that helps you in your field identification of spiders by looking at their webs. Again, this is a, a contrast of the, uh, you know, the sort of um, Tetranathidae web there with the open hub and then the Araneidae web there with the building hub. And then the actual accounts of the spiders, I mean, they've got everything you want from a field guide. They've got distribution maps, they've got little phenology charts there so you get a rough idea of when you can see them mature. But the innovation that I absolutely love about this book is these little, um, these little symbols, which is either an eye like this one, I've got my mouse cursor over there at the top of the page, or if I go down a bit, a microscope, or what's not shown on this page, a little magnifying glass. And those symbols mean that, for example, here it's telling you that you can identify this, uh, this family, uh, sorry, this genus, Amarobius, by sight. So you're not really get, once you get a little bit of experience, you're not really confused them with anything else, and you can say, with more or less certainty in the field, that is anaerobious. But what it's also telling me there is that to, that to be 100% certain about the identification of this species, anaerobious similis, I really need to look at it under a microscope. And that's because it's very similar to another one which I mentioned earlier called Fenestralis. Now, if you're making a record, that's very important to make sure that you get that ID right, that you're 100% certain. We'll talk about rec records a bit later, but if you're just trying to ident identify it for your own enjoyment, then there's no need to put it under a microscope. You found it on a house, you can be sort of 95% sure, or maybe a bit surer that it's this one, Amarobius similis. If you find it in the field, well, it could be one or the other, you can't really say. So it's quite a sort of subtle art, but these, these symbols really help a lot. Here's the nursery web spider. So this is telling me, well, there's only there's only one spider in this genus, and you see so you're kind of, and you can identify it by eye. You don't need to even look at it with a magnifying glass. As soon as you once you're used to spider ID, once you've got your eye in, you've read the book, you've done it for a year or something, you can do these by eye. Let's talk about other resources. So we're nearly at the end now. 
uh, this is the spider recording scheme website so the url is printed down there at the bottom but i've also put it on that pdf that information which i've prepared for you and this is great for seeing like where spiders are found in the country when they're found and lots of other information besides so the spider recording scheme is a scheme of the british arachnological society but it's about recording uh, spiders so making records of what you found and when you found it and so on this i think is a fantastic resource when you're especially when you're learning field idea spiders so i put one of the resources up here this is a facebook group obviously there's more than one there are local facebook groups on spiders and so on but this uk spiders i think is a really well-run facebook group and um when you're learning spider id live spider id just if you're if you're into social media if you just keep an eye on this group you will see dozens of pictures just you know they keep coming people sending in pictures and there are experts on this group who will put a name to it so very rarely does a does anything slip through and get incorrectly identified on this sometimes i feel they're identified with too much confidence when i think hmm, might be something else but it's a great way to learn your spider id i really recommend that you look at that again i put the i put the url of that group on the um, pdf so let's talk about making records you don't have to make records to enjoy spiders uh, they give you a lot of satisfaction just by going out and learning about them watching them in particular um, but records of spiders can help you know they, they can help for example confer status on a local wildlife site if it's a rare spider uh, or even if it's a common spider if there are a lot of different species of common spiders that helps in uh, confer um, some cachet to that site you know so, some status to that site so records are very useful and to make a record you need four bits of information what you saw where you saw it so usually with a grid reference as well as a location name when you saw it and your name to say who identified it um, with spiders, the spider recording scheme likes to encourage a bit of extra information like the habitat that you found it in, the kind of structure and how you recorded it. Did you find it by sweep netting or by grubbing, uh, which is like just uh, scratching around, or did you just find it on vegetation and so on by chance? So that's extra information that adds value to a record. Um, so on the handout i've put some information some ideas about where you can submit records if you decide that you want to make them now i wish i could say there's one place that is the best place but unfortunately recording isn't is a bit sort of disjointed in our country and in spiders in particular i have to say so there are there are different options and the the thing i would advise you to do most of all if you're really getting serious about spider recording is try and contact your spider recording scheme area organizer if they're like me so I, i'm the area organizer of cheshire lancashire and i will use i i take records from uh, i record for example i've given you the url for i record but not all spider recorders area organizers do so it's best to find out how they operate and then then you can tailor the way you submit your records okay very quick quiz so this is true or false you can score yourself I haven't given you all the answers today. One or two of the questions are controversial, maybe. So, are spiders are poisonous. <clears throat> you quite often hear this that spiders are poisonous. Well, are they? I mean, I'm normally in a classroom, so I can ask and people shout out, but I can't really do that today. Spiders aren't poisonous; they're venomous. Okay, so they inject they inject poison into their prey, so that makes them venomous. But you can quite happily eat a spider, and it will not poison you. There can be two million spiders in an acre of meadowland. Um, well, you know, that sounds a lot, but actually it's a it's a real statistic. Now, have I got the book up there? Here, I can show you the book. But, so the bloke that wrote this book, Bristow, William Bristow, uh, came up with that statistic. And he's, I mean, uh, who would argue with William Bristow? Because he's um, a fantastic, he was a fantastic arachnologist. Obviously, he didn't count all the spiders in, a, in a acre, an acre of meadowland. He, probably counted them in a yard square or something back in the 1930s and then multiplied up but there are a lot of spiders you know a lot of small spiders Bell. females always eat the males after mating i think you can probably guess that that is 
false. Um, it happens in quite a lot of families, even the Araneidae, which we were looking at, you know, the old weavers, they are known to do that, but even in those, they don't always do it. And females some, will sometimes eat the males in that group, but in a lot of groups, they, they, it doesn't even cross their mind. For example, the jumping spiders, we haven't looked at jumping spiders today, I couldn't find, uh, couldn't find one to show you, um, but they, they take hours sometimes over their mating uh, and because there's no danger of the female eating the male. Whereas with the garden garden spider, the male inseminates the, fi the female in a fraction, and I mean a fraction, with probably less than a tenth of a second. He's in and out very quick because there is a danger that the female will eat him. Many spiders are vegetarians. The answer to that is definitely no. Um, it used to be there were no vegetarian spiders, but a couple of years ago, someone I think has claimed to find a spider which is a vegetarian spider, but that's out of 40 odd thousand species that we know about in the world. There's one known vegetarian at the last count. Anyway, Little Miss Muffet was real. This is one that the jury is out on actually. Um, I've got a note here. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, an entomologist and physician called it uh, Thomas Muffet, that's right. He's said, said to have composed that for his uh, stepdaughter, but it's actually sort of hearsay. No one actually knows. There's no real evidence, but Little Miss Muffet, something tough there. Uh, could have been real, a real person. Spider silk is stronger than steel. The, the answer to that is most definitely yes. It's an extremely strong material, pound for pound, uh, and it's much stronger than steel. In, in fact, it's one of the strongest materials we know about. Spider's webs were used to dress wounds, and this, yeah, historically they were um, and one of the main reasons for this is that apart from being very strong and light of course which is a, a good uh, property to have if you're dressing a wound the other one is that they're completely inert for whatever reason um, so the body won't reject silk so there, there's quite a lot of research going on at the moment in, in using silk in surgery sometimes to build sort of scaffolding for the, for the body's tissues to um, uh, to grow it through again because the body doesn't reject it, it's completely inert. Are there any more? Spiders can fly. Okay, sometimes people argue with me about this because I say they can fly, um, but they don't have wings, of course, and a lot of, but a lot of spiders will disperse literally thousands of miles by ballooning. And if you think of a hot air, hot air balloon, you say that flies, doesn't, don't you, even though it's not powered flight. So I think uh, I would say that spiders uh, can fly. Eating spiders was a recommended cure for fever. Well, that turns out remarkably to be true as well. And uh, here's the evidence to show that. This is um, from the 18th century, swallowing a spider gently bruised and wrapped up in a raisin or spread upon bread and butter. Uh, that was a recommended cure for fever uh, back in the day. Okay, that's the end of the quiz. So I think uh, we're into questions now. Just to say, um, yeah, that was fantastic, Rich. Thank you. That was a really nice overview. And I don't think anyone's, I, I've, I've seen anyone try on Zoom with live um, spiders <laughs> under a microscope or any, any live animal, to be honest, apart from dogs and cats. So uh, no, that, that was brilliant. And they came out pretty clearly as well. So Good. I just, I should say to everyone that those are, there are, they're all going to be set free after this um, chat. They, most of them were collected this morning and I'll be letting them all out afterwards. There we go. It's that easy to go and find some and uh, have a look. So, yeah. Uh, brilliant. And, and just before we go into questions, I, I just, um, Rich mentioned that vegetarian spider. Um, Trevor, I don't know who Trevor is, but it just put a link from, to Wikipedia to that. And it's called Bagheera Kiplingai. <laughs> must be a very big fan of the Jungle Book there. That's, yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely love that. Um, yeah, there was a question. The first question I think we had was from Charlotte, uh, which says, you mentioned orb weavers are noticeable this time of year. Do they and other species breed at specific times of year or all year round or does it depend on species? Um, it depends on species but the answer is that they're a bit again I keep wondering why do I keep going back to moths am I a frustrated moth but <laughs> they're a bit like moths in that they're, they are quite there are quite clear peaks for most species I would say so that if you look at the phenology 
graphs, the, the little bar charts on, well, either in that book um, that I've pointed out or on that website that I've given you the link to, the SRS website, you'll see some quite sharp peaks of when the adults of different species are found and they tend to be spread out. And as I say, I think the more, the more people are recording now in the winter, the more we're realizing. I mean, one of the reasons I, I love recording spiders is because you can go out in the middle of winter, literally the middle of the winter, and you can find not just a few species, you can find dozens of species. In fact, I would rather go out in December and January to the woods up on the moors here and sit litter than I would now or in the summer. Uh, so yeah, they, 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 the different species had peaks at different times of the year, but there are species, I think some of the big ones, like, I don't know this for sure, I'm kind of half guessing, but I imagine that house spiders, well, actually, no, they do mate, they, they definitely mate most in the autumn, house spiders. Um, and this, and, and this is why people, lots of members of the public, are reporting giant spiders in the autumn, isn't it? Yeah, well, that, there's two reasons, really. One is because the orb weavers, which I've been showing you now, uh, today, are so much more conspicuous at this time of year, sitting in the middle of their webs. So people think, well, you know, why are there so many spiders all of a sudden? That's just their life cycle. Uh, and the other one, at the same time of year, the, um, the tegenarias, the house spiders, uh, the males go looking for females to mate with, and so there you see them running around the house quite a bit. So yeah, that, that's the two main reasons that people think. But there are big spiders, you know, at other times of the year too. It's just so it happens that some of the ones associated with human habitation, uh, like the garden spider and the and the house spider, they do get active and bigger this time of year. So people think that all spiders do, but it's not all spiders. Right, um, and. Steve is just asking what what make of handheld microscope you've got. So I've had one in the drawer for years, and I and I uh, went to set it up on Monday to test it, and it didn't <laughs> didn't work because I've got a new computer. So I found the cheapest one I could find on the internet. Um, have I got the box? I think I've got the box somewhere, um, but it was about fifteen quid. If that, I mean, you can get them for a lot of money. Uh, don't spend a lot of money. That's my advice. Get one that's cheap. And in particular, just make sure, you know, when you look at the details, make sure, so if you're a Windows 10 user, make sure it works with Windows 10. If you're a Mac user, make sure it says Mac when you, you know, before you buy it. But I literally plugged and played that. I didn't have to install any software. It came with a little disc, but I plugged it in and it works. And that was it. I, I downloaded the actual bit of, I didn't have to install a driver or anything like that. I downloaded the bit of software I used to actually show the pictures on the screen, but I, I just downloaded it off the internet because I haven't got a disc reader on my computer. It's a laptop, um, but you can just get it off the internet now, so it didn't matter. Okay, and then uh, we've got three questions from James from the Isle of Man. Um, any help pronouncing scientific names correctly? I suppose, have you got any tips on that? Uh, yeah, my, my biggest tip is do not worry about it. <laughs> say it with confidence, <laughs> however you say it. And you know what, it's not, there's a lot of nonsense talked about the right and the wrong way to pronounce Latin names. There is no right and wrong way. There, like, there's no right and wrong way to pronounce English words. It's absolute rubbish. Um, you have to be understood. So if you can say a name, like for example, I think I called, um, the walnut spider, Nuctenia umbratica. Nuctenia, I say Nuctenia. Some people say Nuctenia, you know, but what the hell? I, they know what I mean if I say Nuctenia. So my, my advice is do not worry about it. Even experts will say it differently. There is some, I think there's, Jeff Oxford might have done something on it recently. We're trying to sort of get to the bottom of what is the accepted, if you want, you know, like, um, what's that word they've got for, the right way to talk English, <laughs> whatever the equivalent is for, for Latin, he was trying to get to the bottom of it, but I just think it's a, why bother? <laughs> yeah, I, got, um, I must just tell you, I've got a very, very good friend, my best mate in, um, he lives in Hastings, he's also a spiderist, he's um, same age as me, same name as me, we met on an MSc course on biological recording, and he can't, he can't say any Latin names, you know, correctly. I mean, he really mashes them up, but I know what he's talking about. <laughs> so we get by. And because he, he doesn't care, he just says what he, says it the way he says it. 
Okay, that, and then the second question from James. Any tips for keeping spiders still under the scope? That Well, um, try not to get them too warm, uh, I would say. Um, they tend to move about. Oh, it, under... What, are we talking about a live spider or dead spiders? <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess it must mean live spiders if you keep trying to keep them still. Yeah. Um, well, live spiders is a spy pot, you know. I mean, I didn't really have to do much to prevent those ones from moving. But if they're moving about and you're really trying to see, say, the structure of a palp or an epigyne, then you can very just gently push them up against the cling film. That's why the cling film is there. It gives. So it doesn't, as long as you don't mash them into it, it won't hurt them. And then you can get your lens right up to it or your microscope or whatever. Obviously, if you point it under a microscope sort of stage, if it's a binocular microscope, the biggest problem is actually then getting the microscope far enough away from it because the spy pots tend to be quite a little bit tall. So that's the biggest, that can be the biggest problem. Um, but yeah, spy pot is excellent. The optical qualities of cling film are very, very good. Uh, so as long as you can avoid the glare of the light on it, you, you can see very, very clearly through cling film. Okay, um, do the British Arachnological Society and I record share records or is it worth recording on both sites? Um, again, this depends where you live. So if you lived in, Lanc or if you were recording, should I, I should say, so you made a bunch of records in Lancashire, you could put them on I record. I would verify them on I record, And then at the end of the year, I would, I, because the quid pro quo from, I actually work for BRC and I record as well. I should, I should uh, make that clear as I'm talking here. But the, the quid pro quo of getting people to verify stuff on iRecord is that they can then download those records that, that, that they're verifying for their recording scheme. So I'm within my rights, as it were, to then download the records that I verified on iRecord and submit them to the National Spider Recording Scheme. But that's on an individual basis. So if you're in another county, I'm not going to name any because I don't really know enough about who does what where, but you might find that the, the recorder there doesn't engage with iRecord and iRecord doesn't have a sort of a default link to um, the, re the spider recording scheme. Some recording schemes I record and recording scheme is very close to my big regret. We're not there yet, although we have, you know, um, with, with spiders, though the spider recording scheme and I record are talking, you know, we have, we have meetings and so on. So we're looking to work more closely, but it's not there yet. And you really need to talk to your local area organizer for, your, for the spider recording scheme. Do you know, for, for James in particular, do you know about the setup on the Isle of Man? Oh, Isle of Man? Blimey, no, I don't. Um, if, if James can't get an answer through Google or whatever, or looking on the SRS website, then, then um, just email me. I don't know if my, I'm quite happy for my email to go out. It's, it's anyone who wants to know, it's rich.berkmar at gmail.com. And if you, if you need an answer to a question like, please try and find out the answer to your, yourself first. But if you're really stuck, then email me and I'll um, see if I can find out. Okay, uh, thank you. So a question from Catherine now. Um, I struggle to work out whether a house spider was male or female. There seemed to be a small swelling at the end of the palps, yeah. but it wasn't large. Could this have been an immature male? Yes, in a word. Um, they are quite slender. The palps, you know, as I said, the different species, the, you know, the male's palps differ in structure. And in some spiders, the palps are fairly slender. Now, from a certain angle, particularly if you looked at a, a, a palp of a, money, a, of a house spider from the top, it might look quite slender. If you look at it from the side, it looks a bit more swollen. Um, so it depends how you, how you see it. But yes, the... The palps of male money spiders with successive, sorry, money spiders, of any spider, the male palps get more swollen with successive molts. So the nearer they get to maturity, the more swollen they get. They're, they can even be quite big, say it's that they're one molt away from being an adult. The, the, the swelling will be very pronounced, but the, you can still tell it's not an adult because the swelling will be quite smooth. There'll be no structure as such on it no bits sticking out or holes going in after that final molt when they become adult then you can see all of that structure so yes it could have been it could have been an immature male 
but you have to, there's a lot of things you have to go by, like size and so on. And of course, you know, you, you have to have a kind, kind of a guess or clue as to what species it is to, as, in order to know whether it's big or small uh, for that species. Um, and S Steve has just mentioned that, um, just saying how, that he, he wanted to say how good he's found plastic envelopes rather than spy pot. Yeah. So maybe that's another option. Um, Absolutely. You know, like, you know, like you used to get, um, like for DVDs or CDs, just a little plastic clear envelope. I know a lot of people use them because they're quite small, they're flat, they're fairly str strong as well, so they don't sort of flop about all over the place and you can just slot a spider in one of those and see it both sides kind of, you know, flip it over to see the underside, then flip it over the other way to see the um, to see the top. So a lot of people like those. I really like the spy pots. Um, it's just the way I operate in the field because I can pop something in a spy pot. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I like to do is just hold it like that one of my hand. You know, I've got two hands free. Um, I know that it's safe in there. It's not too squashed because I've pulled the, the plunger back a bit. Um, but there are lots of different solutions to that, yeah. But those little plastic envelopes, a lot of people like them. Okay, then uh, a question from Carl, which uh, I might be able to answer a little bit. How long does it take for records to filter through from iRecord to MBN Atlas? So, for, I, I, Rich, can, Rich can answer about, about spiders, but I just, I'll, I'll just say, say to Carl, there's a, we, have, we have a web page on Northwest Invertebrates that, that has is a, is a big table and it lists all the different invertebrate recording schemes and also the record centers and just says how, how, recent, how up to date their data is on the MBN, how accessible it is, and if it's on iRecord, how, how often it is updated, which is every two months at the moment for the ones connected to iRecord in a, in a, in a, in a specific way with, with the BRC, which Martin Harvey, I think, organises. Um, but, but you can have a look at that web page that we've got and, and see for other invertebrates. But I, think, but I don't think they do with the spiders, Rich. Yeah, again, you know, very much to my, my personal regret, the, the, I, the spider recording scheme currently doesn't have a relationship with the MBN, so the spider recording scheme does not share its records with the MBN. So any spider records that you see on the MBN have come through another course. So maybe a, a local recording center. So what I would say to you, if you're very invested in the idea of the MBN, which I, I would totally you know, get because I am as well, and you really, really want your records to go on the MBN, then you should be submitting them to uh, some other source that you know will go there. So a local environmental record center is a very good option for that. Um, there's nothing to stop you submitting them in two places. So if you're very keen for them to go on to the MBN, you could do that through your local record centre, but you could also, for example, submit the, the same records to um, iRecord, if you know that the spider recording scheme is dealing with it in that area, or straight to the, um, the national recorder. You know, there is an option to send a spreadsheet of records to Peter Harvey, the national recorder, to get them into the um, SRS database that way. I know it ends up with record duplication, none of us want that, but sometimes that's the lesser of two evils. Um, I, I guess in the future they, you, they might do the, they might go from iRecord to MBN. Is, 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 do you think there's a chance of that happening, Rich? A lot of recording groups do, but the only way that will happen is if the, the recording scheme sanctions it. So that's the way that DRC and iRecord operate. It will we will pass records direct to the MBN if the recording group scheme for that group wants it to happen. But currently, it, the spider recording scheme doesn't. Yeah, I think that number is increasing though. I think because I just did the review, it was 17 schemes last year and 22 now, I think. Great. So, <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's certainly um, going up. Um, I'm just looking for any more questions. Is, has anybody got anything further? You feel free to to put your hand up as well, um, you know, physically or using that virtual symbol if you like. Um, and I've got someone who's just saying, um, asking for a reminder about the microscope details. The the one that I'm using here, do you mean? 
I think so. I think it must be. Uh, here it is. Uh, I've got the box over here. Just bear with me. <laughs> this is what it was. G J I U S I O N digital microscope. I got it off. Uh, sorry, off Amazon. <coughs> Okay, well, if, if, if nobody ha has um, any other questions um, for today, then I would encourage you all to spend this lovely, well, sunny afternoon for me. It looks like going out looking for spiders, maybe creating a spy pot and, and having a go, really.